So let, let me switch gears a little bit and use the framework of the three letters and ask you about your life in the O letter. So it's been five years without Connie. You've moved from 84 to 89. You're living in Florida now. What, what's your life like now as an old woman? Uh, what my life? Well, fortunately, um, as an old woman, all of my years, I have always had a trainer. I did swimming. I played tennis. I walk. I eat well. I was one of those, uh, what do they call those people that, uh, I forgot already. <laughs> you know, I, I eat well. I don't eat crap. I have, uh, I made a deal with myself. Chocolate instead of alcohol. Because alcohol and chocolate both have calories. I don't want the alcohol calories because they don't serve me, but the chocolate, okay. So I have every night a wonderful kind of a tea, whatever serves me, whether it's a health tea, whether it's a sleep tea, whether it's a stress tea or whatever, with two dark chocolate grains. As far as being old, I first am experiencing in the last year, physical symptoms of being old. And that for me is walking slower, taking care of myself in more of a way, making sure that I have the routine of breakfast, lunch, dinner, supplements, fruit and veg uh, vegetables, fruit in between, et cetera, et cetera, a whole program. Uh, also what I need, I am someone who loves to have people. So being alone five years was very, very difficult. And uh, I'm grateful. There are many people here to choose from. There's a lot of activities to participate. Last night, I went to the theater that we have here. I live in Century Village, West Palm Beach. And the theater had a wonderful singer. And I went with a couple of my friends, straight women. It doesn't matter to me anymore because I am not interested. <clears throat> in forming any kind of romantic relationship. I had the best, why even try? So I'm fine. And uh, what, what isn't so fine for me is having children and grandchildren living all over the United States and far away. Nobody lives near Florida. And that's become difficult because th at this particular time of my life, family is number one as it has been and even more so yeah well let, let let's go back a little bit there Ruthie for people who are seeing the film for the first time um, and got a sense in the film about the difficulty it was for your kids when you came out what has been the trajectory over all this time with your kids and your grand grandkids? How did all that end well, up playing out? With my kids, it was only one, 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 one son that kept away from me. Uh, and then it reached the point in my life when he had children, I said, hey, that's enough. I'm the grandmother and uh, went to visit. The kids were delightful to me. And, and we have come together. He has an end, just a delightful, I'm very fortunate. I have wonderful in-laws and uh, of my children's. And uh, my children's children accepted, my gr grandchildren were totally open, sure. shared with who I was, with their friends, with the people. Uh, that they were in contact with, with the work, and uh, it made it simpler for them. Right. Well, that's the, that's the generational change, too, don't you think? That the, the world has changed for them. Well, they're, not, they're all different ages. I'm very uh, grateful. I, I have them from young teenage all the way to the 30s and I in see. between. I so it's, it was different. Right. right. But it still happens when you speak up. It yeah. still happens yeah. in a more positive way. Right. 
and and I learned to speak up very early in life, very early in life. Tell the story. Well, the story was, well, to begin with, my mother was physically handicapped. She had polio. So handicapped people, when I was a little girl, and my mother had handicapped friends, I was so sensitive to it that I would run away in a corner and, start, and cry to see these people. But then I, and, and my mother tried to explain it to me and I seemed to have understood. My father died when I was 10 and his education came in a different way and that we can bring up later. Uh, but my mother was very keen on education. So my going to kindergarten was like a birthday for her. <laughs> I go to kindergarten and the story, I was so happy in school. And at that time, it goes back a long time, uh, you were in a particular seat with a desk. Next to me was Arthur. Now this goes back, what, 84 years? And I remember Arthur's name. I could take you to the classroom. I could take you all over. I have this wonderful picture that I'm taking home to show my mother. I'm so excited. My bubby is downstairs, four flights down by the school, waiting to take me home because I had to cross a boulevard street as one of the streets to get home. And my mother was working. So what happens is Arthur comes over to my desk and tears my paper, my picture. Well, what was I going to do? The teacher didn't see it. She was fixing the, the blinds. Well, I pick myself up. I go to Arthur. I tear his picture. Guess what? The teacher sees it. And she says, you're staying in. First day of school. What the, does staying in mean? And I said, I show my picture. I said, Arthur did it to me as well. She says, Arthur, you're staying in. Well, we caught on what staying is meant when everybody left. <laughs> and about, I don't know how many minutes later, the teacher takes a whitefish sandwich and starts to, white, white uh, bread sandwich and starts to eat lunch, turns around and says to Arthur, you may leave. That was the clicker. Arthur, you may leave, who did it to me? Okay. Arthur leaves, what am I gonna do? My bubby's waiting downstairs for me, maybe, who knows? She won't know what to do, she has no idea, she doesn't speak English. The teacher goes back to her sandwich, turns around, Ruthie runs down four flights, no bubby, crosses over Stone Avenue, Christopher Street, Sackman Avenue, finally gets home. My mother comes home and I'm just crying, crying, crying. I am not going back to school. Well, my mother took me back, said she will watch me outside the door. The teacher said, you can't do that. And uh, she's, so my mother said, well, I'll take her out and put her in first grade. And the teacher said, well, she will never adjust to school. It just so happens I have four degrees. I think I adjusted, or maybe I couldn't adjust. That's why I have so many. So that was the first. That was the key of injustice. That's right. That was the, that was the root of it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then my next step was, if I may, in ninth grade, I was in the special class, you know, so the smart kids, 9SP. And uh, it came around Christmas time and Christmas usually comes with Hanukkah. And I said to myself, because I came from an Orthodox home, Orthodox Jewish home. I said to myself, you know, every Christmas time that comes, the music teacher always wants to, always teaches us more Christmas songs, Christmas songs, Christmas songs. I go to my friend Sheila, who was in 9B1. I said, Sheila, when Mrs. Parker walks in, tell your, your class, nobody sings. The other two classes, I got the presidents to do the same thing. 
Nobody sings, no matter what song she plays to begin with. Well, sure enough, she comes in. Hello, welcome, everybody. Nice to see you all. Starts to play the piano and plays the song, which I'll tell you later. Nobody sings. Tries again. Three times she tries. Nobody sings. She says, something is going on here. So I got up. Yes, I explained. I said, we're Jewish kids also, and we want Hanukkah songs. She says, that's not the way to do it. You have to, you know, speak to the principal. You should have done it a different way, et cetera, et cetera. I'm reporting you to the principal. Your mother's going to have to come up. Okay, I was happy that my mother could come up because she was physically handicapped. That usually sets people off. I was happy that my mother could come up because the principal was Jewish. So was my mother. So I had, I had some pluses, a couple of base hits. And sure enough, I'm reprimanded. I had to stay in after, write things about it. But we did get Hanukkah songs. Guess what song she played? Have oh. any idea? I will tell you. Her first song was Jingle Bells. Nobody sang Jingle Bells. Right. So that was a start. And I continued throughout high school, college, and other times on my cell, on alo alone, and had support from my friend Sheila and other people. And uh, then Connie came into my life. And when I fell in love with her numerous years later, and uh, we came together prior to that, um, we worked to make changes in relationship to the holidays, Judaism, etc. Ruthie, let, let me ask you this. When you met Connie and all the years that you were friends and raising the kids and young mothers, was she as outspoken and frontal as you were, or did she become that way as a result of being your partner? I saw that she had it. She had it in her. Uh -huh. That when we when our children were a little older, we needed to move to another apartment. We were able to get into what was called Contello Towers. Yeah, cooperative, very fine. You could, you had to have a room for your son, for your daughter, a bedroom, etc. And Women's American Art was coming to our community. They wanted to start a chapter, organization for rehabilitation through training, a Jewish organization. I remember walking out the door to go to the next building to go to the meeting and I tapped Connie and I said to Connie, I am nominating you for president. I will be behind you. I will be your miscellaneous, but you will be president. And she made an outstanding president. I knew the qualities she had she did not have the opportunity to use them because her husband didn't care about it. Prior to that, her parents didn't care about it. In fact, they told her, no, you're not going to college. You're going to work. You need to work for us and bring money into the house. She was, she was a brilliant, creative woman. And behind me now, you can see some of her artwork mm -hmm. over here. Yep. And here yeah we came together and we developed each other's best parts what did she develop in you she developed in me an opportunity to be as creative as i wanted to be with my ideas and she followed them and helped me out okay the thing i was thinking when when i asked you about what was the shift from Ruthie being in the world fighting injustice at every opportunity to Ruthie and Connie being in the world fighting injustice. Connie brought a tenderness also. Connie was a wonderfully tender woman, I always felt. Does yeah, that, she, was, yeah. she, was, she was very tender and uh, she was tough. She was yeah. tender and she was tough. Yeah. 
Yeah. And she knew how to handle an audience. She was brilliant with that. In what way? No matter what they said, the craziness that could come out from people after seeing the film, straight people mostly, uh, she was able to handle them with an answer that didn't show anger, disappointment, or wanting to blow up and punch him. <laughs> she didn't show that. She had that wonderful talent. That might not have been true of you. Not, not true of me. No. Not totally true of me. Yeah. I could open up my mouth. I know that. I know that. I learned that simply because my mother didn't. 